I can just put a couple of goats on my lap. <laughs> Rob, we don't need you for our opening quote today. We got one already. <coughs> that's that. That's perfect. Crashing economies, crashing countries, and crashing drones up here in Northern California. I'm Ron Pepper. And I am Rob Morota from Canada, and I'm just so envious that I don't have a goat on my lap now. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Photo Focus Podcast. It's a roundtable for October 2023. This month, we're going. We have two actually returning guests. We're happy to have. Uh, coming back to us is Christy Turner, uh, also up there in Canada, Rob, who is a multi-genre photographer. But we really asked her because of her astrophotographer chops. Uh, also a public speaker, digital creator, IT consultant. You'll find her at auroramedia.pro. And also returning Jeff Sullivan, great landscape photographer, leading workshops up there near me, up, up in the up in the mountains near here, uh, co-founder of Great Basin School of Photography. Find him at jeffsullivanphotography.com. But before we bring them in, Rob, would you like to lead off the thank you sponsor portion of the show? Of course, yes. And our sponsor, as usual, is... Uh... Oh, uh, Jesus. I should really know this by now. A year and a half career- later. <laughs> exactly. Oh, the Yes, that's right. The creators of Photomatics. We are. <laughs> Thank you to HDR Soft for creating Photomatics and being a sponsor of this show. We wouldn't be here without you, and quite frankly, my business wouldn't be where it is without you either. So. Thank you to Photomax. If you haven't already tried it, it is for HDR photography. And if you haven't tried HDR photography, well, where have you been? It has been like the latest craze the, since, oh, I don't know, latest craze since 2009. <laughs> it's on your iPhones, but it's even better when you do it on the computer. So. Well, I happen to, happen to know it was, uh, that was a craze started in 2002. <clears throat> the HDR oh. thing came to, came to photography via the first the first plug-in mm-hmm. uh, photoshop tried to add hdr and it was so badly done it wasn't for photographers so i shouldn't say it was badly done it was done for 3d but uh the creators of photomatics brought in a plug-in to make it tone mapped into photos for uh so you yes. can view them on regular screens and there's going to be some uh some discussion about hdr today i know because i saw uh, they're actually adobe updates but we can see if we think Ooh. it's going to we can see if Adobe's uh, going to rival Photomatics or not. <laughs> ah, <laughs> but more uh-oh, on that later. More on but that later. But if you haven't tried HDR Soft's Photomatics, try it now. It is a free download, and you can definitely, uh, well, you'll have fun playing with it. So just go to hdrsoft.com, download it, try it, and tell them Rob saying, yeah, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and I wouldn't have had a business at the same in the same way before if it weren't for photomatics either so uh in fact uh let's use that segue i think jeff you and i know each other originally because we were communicating about some hdr things isn't that right i'm sure yeah i think it was about photomatics i think yeah, so for anyone who hasn't uh listened to the the first time give us a quick you know 15 second elevator pitch of who you are and what you do I'm a uh, landscape photographer. I've uh, been doing photography since, oh man, I got to put a year on it, 74. And I started with black and white photography, went into digital in uh, 1984 with scan pictures, and uh, then digital photography 2002 and on. Uh, went into it full time 2006, started workshops in 2010. So, been oh. doing that ever since. Wonderful. Wonderful. So mostly landscape then? uh, Not necessarily. I've always had a great interest in uh, space and NASA. I went to the first space shuttle landing uh, and the fourth at Edwards Air Force Base. I've been to several NASA socials. uh, And I started doing astrophotography in 2009 when I bought the Canon 5D Mark II, which was one of the first sensors uh, that could really do Milky Way photography really well. Shoot at high ISO, so... Oh, perfect. And actually, speaking of yeah. 
Milky Way and Astro Photography. We've got another Astro Photographer here who we had on the show before when we were talking about the Northern Lights. And welcome back, Christy Turner. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. Yeah. It's good to see and you guys. Good to see you as well. And so your turn. 15 second. Who are you for those who don't know you? <clears throat> I live in Alberta, Canada. Um, and in my backyard, I have some world-class nature and of course northern lights and great many dark sky regions so i take full advantage of that i also do weddings commercial photography people that sort of thing and uh yeah i'm pretty addicted to chasing storms and northern lights yeah it was no. really fun the last conversation that got me really interested in joining the crowds which i didn't know were there but we're gonna ask you a little bit about that kind of planning later. I, I think we're going to wait and talk about Eclipse at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I've been wanting, uh, we, on our last show, I think it was the last show, I said I wanted to do a little bit about Eclipse up until the full uh, Eclipse that's coming up in April, because that's the real uh, main event, I think, for that kind of, uh, not only photography, but just the whole experience. So I just wanted to uh, encourage people to really learn about it ahead of time. And uh, then... I didn't really realize it, but when I started looking into eclipses, there's this other kind, other eclipse, the annular, is that right? Eclipse that you get a ring around the moon. So we're going to talk about that because that's coming up <laughs> on the 14th and we're, this is coming out on the 12th. So I hope people are listening soon. So we're going to get to that. And, uh, but before that, uh, a few kind of updates and, um, we're going to talk about common mistakes for photographers to avoid, but. Let's start with, uh, because Adobe Max is going on right now, and I know we give Adobe way too much uh, free advertising and all that, but, you know, they're big, and we do, I think, we, do we all use Adobe? Mm -hmm. yeah. I do. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, it's worth talking about. So, um, in fact, I texted, I think half of the Photo Focus uh, crew are there, so I texted a few people to see uh, if they had some insider information, and um, even though he's not officially Photo Focus, Colin Smith at Photoshop Cafe, he's been on. Mm -hmm. He already posted a video because I said, "Do you have any insider info?" And he says, "Yeah, I just posted some things." So he literally put up, I guess, from his hotel room or something, a demo on some of the new th on the new uh, features. And as you might guess, that's pretty much AI stuff, and uh, that fits right into our conversations too. If you haven't heard the last the last show, we had an AI expert on, so yeah. go back and get some tips there but and, uh has anybody else besides me gone over what's new go ahead rob sorry and actually if you haven't listened to the last episode definitely do that but ron in the show notes did you actually put the pictures of the ai generated ron pepper with pikachu i did you didn't see that uh, i didn't see the, it okay i gotta take post. a look now it's yes we had a couple focus. of com, and then <laughs> that'll be the when you're right now, it'll be the latest one. When you're hearing most people hear this, it'll be the second to latest one. But it says Q and A. Um, we did a whole Q and A show just about AI. Yeah. And I put Rob's AI generated. Can I just say it? Crap. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was a really cute cat riding backwards on a truck. So that was that was that was better than the stuff with me. Although it, it made me look all AI, and I had fabulous hair. Yes. I had like, a, like what was that movie where the they were like toys? <laughs> Um, oh, I know. It was like a, ah, Tim, uh, Tim Allen Santa Claus movie where they had the toy Santa Claus, but he was toy story full size. Oh, um, he looked very toyish, but he looked, he looked AI now that I realize mm -hmm. it. So that was, uh, I don't know. Was that funny? I, don't well, know. <laughs> I liked it anyways. Okay. So, okay. So what are we talking about with Adobe max and the AI topics? What do you want to well, get into first? the the big ones um in fact there was a lightroom update that i just did before we came on here and i did quick 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 tests of a couple things and there was uh well first of all there's a new one called lens blur so mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. their version using ai to uh to uh fake the focus the depth of field focus yeah so the ai must be to identify what's with depth in the sh in the shot because have you ever tried have you guys ever tried to take a photo that's has full depth of field everything's in focus and then try to fake it mm -hmm. it's not easy mm -hmm. right it comes down to masking right yeah 
And, and it's so th- funny, the iPhone does that computationally all the time, but we as mm-hmm. photographers using Photoshop find it really hard to actually get it to work. Well, the, but the phone is using it from different lenses, literally, that, that take yeah. different information. Is yeah. it? Oh, that's good to know. I think, yeah, too, yeah. there's like some neural filters in Photoshop that do that. So that's the, or that's what yeah. I've done, I think. Well, I, I didn't try it. I grabbed the first photo that was there. I had my uh, real estate catalog open, so I just tried to blur the back wall of the room. <laughs> and it, it did. It did a good job. The, uh, the subject might have been the kitchen island. <laughs> it, it, had, it did a good job of keeping, um, looked like it worked on my quick test. So, I mean, now I think they're calling it um, preview or something, so it's not official, but you still get it in the release. Hmm. And uh, it looks interesting. Another use of, um, Rob, you introduced me to the, uh, the select objects, and it'll just select all the objects at once and then yep. create a, a mask for each of them. So That was pretty neat, yeah. You guys, you guys have any use for such a, such a tool? Um, I've used, like, I've definitely blurred the background for some uh, maybe wedding photos and stuff like that just to, you yeah. know, and I like that you can control the amount of blur that you get, so... Yeah, if it it's works fun to well, play with. Be, yeah, it sounds fantastic. Maybe that's, maybe there's a, there's that solution of um, just fo- keep, get everything in focus when you so that you can so that you just don't get anything out of focus. Mm-hmm. That way, that way you don't make the mistake of focusing on the wrong thing because you can yeah. choose it later. I like the um, no. So is it just lens blur? Like a, you know the difference between say, like it's the bokeh right that they're trying yeah, to thanks emulate. to thanks to Colin's little video I noticed um, you can choose the the style of bokeh oh okay so, so can have like round or they called it like donut and hmm. flare and stuff like that yeah okay now the hmm. other one is um, they don't do motion blur though right like I've I've I was just doom scrolling on Instagram and it's like hey look at this new app you can make uh, take a picture of a car standing still, and then it'll add the motion blur behind it. So it looks like you're shooting a car that's coming towards you. Um, I didn't see anything about that. But no, that must eh? be. Huh. Now, okay, you've got this on here. Uh, on the docket, you've got Firefly 2. What is Firefly? I've never used it. Well, I think, yeah, I was kind of hoping. Do you guys know? Because I <laughs> think I know. No. Um, it sounds like it's, they, they're calling it, uh, right now it's a web app. And mm-hmm. from what I understand, it's, it's, I haven't tried it. It's just, uh, things that we're seeing in Photoshop, like add a person there, add a candle there, add a fireplace there. Um, the, apparently that's actually Firefly is like the, the model, right? We learned from, um, sorry, what was her name, Rob? Coco, right? Coco. Yes. Coco. We learned from Coco that it's all about the model, not the, not the model that you're shooting in front of your camera, but the model that you're build by you know like chat chat gpt it's all the information from the internet so mm-hmm. they're building their model or using their model in firefly 2 and i think it's getting added into photoshop piece oh, by piece okay. or little by little or something like so that. like firefly is the uh the model and then like generative uh generative fill is the engine using that firefly holds it i think okay. I, th- I think yeah, I don't know if Firefly is like a code name or the name of the model, but it's and it is their web app, and it's apparently on version two now. Gotcha. But can you imagine? You know, Adobe's got this all these big, probably got a bunch of big teams working on all these things and finding ways to yes, make because our they're lives thinking better and worse at the same time. Because they're thinking in the background, it's like, okay, so if we can let Rob generate a cat riding backwards on a truck he will spend more money with us then we can that's what they're thinking we we can get money out of him for his whole life right exactly (laughs) which won't last very long if i keep on doing this stuff (laughs) all right so i'm sorry i'm i'm monologuing here jump in guys but i'll 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 keep throwing out what i've heard about there's the uh listeners we can see each other so you guys can do this but uh generative match is um sort of the current controversy of it's taking, you know, taking our jobs or whatever, because apparently it's uh take a photo and generate a bunch of similar photos from it. 
So mm. think think about uh, uh, product photography, maybe, where or food, maybe where yeah. you know, the the client or the the uh, art director they're going to be there saying, well, let's do this, let's change that, let's do, you know. So uh, I think the idea there is that uh, you can start with maybe one or some, and maybe what you're doing, thanks Coco again, is building a little model, <laughs> and then it's uh, generating from that. Hmm. So this is all hearsay because I, I did say this out loud, didn't I, that Max is going on right now. So all this stuff is yeah. being announced and talked about. And yeah. Well, in that case, let's let's hold off on the, these topics because it's happening right now. We're not really sure what's going on. Well, but but we want to be so new about it, don't we? We do. But you know what? <laughs> this is a good segue into the next one. Common mistakes. <laughs> I don't want to make AI? The, using no, AI I don't want to make the, I don't want to make the common mistake of you know saying something that I'm not really knowing anything about and then you know <laughs> having people at me for it. Which, by the way, one common mistake uh, that happened, and we'll get into this on our third topic was so in our last Q and I said that I was really disappointed with the fact that the iPhone did not have any significant changes in their camera and. You know, I was hoping that maybe, you know, they do 4K 120 or something like that, right? And somebody called me out and said, Rob, why the hell would you need 4K 120? And, oh, I thought, oh, good question. Well, the new uh, DJI Mini Pro 4 has 4K 100. So essentially what it does is if you have a higher shutter or a higher frame rate for video, you can slow it down really really well and i would love to see that on the phone but that was th that's why so yeah somebody somebody called me out on that one so i want to to add that but let's talk about common mistakes and the, the problem the most of those people are probably like me that those numbers just start swirling around and get confusing confusing until you do it a few times and so yeah, right it's thanks. like wd-40 it's like oh my god what is that right anyways <laughs> Okay, one let's talk about than, <laughs> one better than WD thirty nine, right? <laughs> WD no squee they call it now. Yeah, I was really surprised to hear that. It's like it's actually yeah number forty that actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it was? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna start naming my the things I do like that. Like how many tries did I take first? <laughs> yeah, offspring right, one, so offspring two. So, <laughs> uh, hmm. yeah. I don't have a joke for that. Um, common, wait, all right. So this is this was from me. I think I saw a I saw a discussion. It's like somebody's trying to be funny. They were talking about common mistakes for beginner photographers, and I thought, why don't we do one of those? Mm -hmm. Except it doesn't have to be beginner. It's whatever, whatever we want because it's an organic show. We do what we want. Why don't we start just going? Where who's Look at you guys. Sorry, Rob and Ron yeah. are taking okay. over again. Christy, Let's go Christy yeah. start off. <laughs> um, well, because of the very active solar cycle we're in, some people might be taking pictures of sunspots. Um, and one thing I, I discovered myself during an eclipse was you can, you, once you've taken the, the filter off when you're in totality or something, not to um, look into your viewfinder because within a minute that's changed and there's more sun coming through and you know you've got possible burn sensors and retinas so yeah, yeah. and and taking it off at the right time you know to make sure you don't uh, mess oh, up I, the shot yeah we'll Bye. we'll make a big deal about it later again but don't look through your lens your real lens finder at the sun please yes <laughs> wow uh, just imagine all those little ants that you burned as a child with a magnifying glass. Now you're <laughs> going to do that to your eye. I guess that's a good way to get rid of cataracts. But um, <laughs> anyway, Jeff, okay. do, you, do you have a do you have a common thing to avoid? Stick to avoid. I have one big one I did recently that you definitely want to avoid. Uh, I I have a background of using Nikon for many many years, and I've had I picked up a Nikon D850. Uh, I, I used Canon for probably nine or 10 years. I picked up a Nikon D850 about five years ago, and I go back and forth between my Canon and my Nikon. Of course, you know, every time you pick up a different camera, it goes, everything is the opposite direction. The zoom goes different. The focus is, ring is in a different place. The lens screws on clockwise or counterclockwise with the two. And I found that you can 
take your uh, Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter lens and you've put it on and it goes to a click and it stops. And then when you go to take it off, you can keep rotating in that direction. It gets past that click and you can no longer rotate it off, but it doesn't go anywhere else. You just brought it past the stop and it just locks there. And I've also oh, no. found out, I've also found out that when you send that into Nikon, uh, them getting you past that little click is a thirteen hundred dollar operation. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Oh so I could have I could have rebought the lens. I probably should have just sawed it off and then I could have bought another lens, a used thir fourteen to twenty four. That camera and, just permanently uh, has that lens on it, huh? Would have cost me the same. Yeah. I mean the only oh problem was it was stuck on the body. I don't know. Huh. I almost I thought of another yeah. one. Yeah. Go for it. Um, because I'm out at night a lot, uh, it's important to get your keep your tripod, all the parts tightened and check it before you go out. Because I've been in situations where it's wobbly suddenly and, mm -hmm. you know, something's going on, whether it's the Aurora or, you know, a beautiful display and I'm dicking around tightening the legs on my tripod or whatever. So uh, taking care of that and making sure you got the little base for it if you need that too, because I've also left that at home. <laughs> and use, oh the use base those, plate yeah use those on those, those plates plate, yeah. on those the plates plate, use yeah. those little those little pop out things that you have to squeeze to get it out because the same thing i it wasn't even my camera somebody else we were doing a team thing and somebody else's camera and his very fancy heavy camera slid down and it was only because i think it was me that didn't that did something wrong probably but it got caught by that little tab mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. make sure you have those they're yeah. spectacular and tighten your legs i've done it i was out of shoot years ago setting up a port uh, a group portrait and all of a sudden everyone in the group starts pointing at me and going oh! and i'm like what and i look back and one of my uh, tripod legs wasn't tightened and so it slowly was falling <laughs> oh, to shit. the side and yeah so tighten your legs for sure uh, <laughs> that was a awful one uh, Make sure was, too, if you set your tripod down on slope ground, that you even it out so that the camera is directly upright. I have so <laughs> many people, so many people that I'm shooting with because I'm shooting with other people all the time, and I'll be working with a group of eight, and they'll set up on a hill, and almost nobody will lower their uphill tripod legs, and so their cameras are precipitous, pre precipitously leaning forward. And one time I got up, this was right after I bought my D850. I had my tripod, we were at a pond, we were gonna get a Milky Way reflection, I'm all set up. And we're on a trail by the pond. And we had, I think 10 people that night and someone on the far end needed some help. And it was a Canon menu. So Lori's like, ah, oh, I'm Nikon, Jeff, you're the Canon expert, get over here. So I'm leave, I leave my brand new camera on a tripod. I get about 15 feet away and I hear a splash. And uh. I, thought that the, I thought that the guy next to me had knocked my brand new camera into the lake. He hadn't. Unfortunately, he had set up his tripod, I think so it was leaning a little bit, and he let go of it and it took a tumble. And his D800E became a D850, but not without a little bit of investment. <laughs> it, they were unable to fix it, unfortunately. So, uh, so yeah. yeah, get your... Get your tripod level, and that doesn't mean just plopping it on a hill and seeing if it falls. Mm -hmm. You really okay. got to get it vertical. We had announced, uh, somebody had announced on here that there maybe it was a Kickstarter. They were doing an auto leveling tripod. Yeah, I was really interested, and I've heard Ooh. nothing about it ever since. No, I haven't seen anything on that. I'm, I'm in the market for that. Oh. That <laughs> now, sounds awesome. All right, so now here's here's one that I've got for you. So... I had one of my staff come to me and was like, I don't know why I'm getting this really bad uh, vignetting. And I said, vignetting? Okay, well, that's easy. Just go into Lightroom and you can just take it out. He goes, no, but I, I tried that. It's not working. But it's weird. It's only on the top right and lower left corners. I thought, what? How could that be? Top right and left. Yeah. Sounds like right, a lens lower head. Super that's right. Like a lens Super wide angle. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the it's the two pedals. So the pedals on the front to keep the lens, light from flaring in, that wasn't on straight. So it was just off to the it was off center. And so what he was catching was the pedals in those corners. So make sure that those pedals are on right. 
And they're done that. Right? <laughs> so that's a good one. And then the other one, this is one that I did at a wedding. I was, uh, I got a brand new camera, but it was the demo camera from a store. And a demo camera on a store will allow the shutter to release without an SD card. Mm -hmm. mm. So <laughs> somewhere during the, the, the event, I took out the SD card to put it into my computer to download the photos. And then I forgot to put the SD card back into the camera. And well, the rest is, unfortunately, there is no history of it. <laughs> no. So that's, I think a lot of cameras ship with that on as a default. So you actually have to turn it off. And why they would ever enable that as a default is beyond no, me. It's terrible. No. It's, you're, probably the other thing, a, you're probably getting a demo model not known to you. Let's, let's talk about dumb camera defaults just for a minute here. The other one, <laughs> okay. it's, it's a pet peeve of mine. Instead of a uh, second curtain flash, they have first curtain, which means that mm -hmm. if you have a long explosion and the flash goes, let's say snow's falling. With first curtain, it goes flash and then the snow falls. So the bright part is at the top. So it looks like your snow is falling up. So mm -hmm. why you would, and, and if a car was moving, it would go flash and then the car would move. So your car would look like it's going backwards. There's, I yeah. can't think of any situation where you want first curtain flash, but that's always the default. That was going to be my question is, is there a, is there a reason to have it as a default? Is there, can anybody think of a reason to have the old fashioned ones, one curtain? No, well, maybe in Australia, cause everything's upside down, oh. right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had an Australian on today. <laughs> okay. You'll, you'll be getting notes after this show. Right. Okay. <laughs> Probably. I've oh. got one. I, I think a mistake is to use auto ISO, but more that's mm -hmm. an opinion. More than that is to leave the ISO in some crazy high number because you're in a tough situation and forgetting about it. That's mm -hmm. a yep. mistake. That's something yep. I've done. So, mm -hmm. so at night, at night we take a lot of dark frames to find the hot pixels. After mm -hmm. shooting at night, every, the next day I almost always take some white frames because my ISO is still way up there. <laughs> there you go. The first one's white because of that, right? Yeah. yeah. I have no yeah. use for them, but I have them. Then I know Actually. that's the beginning of my day. Hey, side note. Hmm. Do you have any cameras that you would, Jeff, like it, or any, well, anybody, but um, I know Jeff does a lot of, both of Jeff and Christy do a lot of night stuff. How high ISO will you go? I had I had somebody I, complaining about a, a problem with some photos recently, and I was like, the insane amount of noise in there. And I looked, and it was twenty thousand ISO. I have found situations where shooting at sixty four hundred or twelve eight is not enough, and I couldn't fix it later. Be, and I know this because I bracketed using different ISOs. I was shooting into the light of the Central Valley in California, which is pretty bright relatively speaking. And then there were shadows in the foreground. And for whatever reason, the shots at 25.6 would let me recover the shadows. And everybody says, oh, ISO invariance, you should be able to set a low ISO and, and brighten it up later. What they're missing is that ISO invariance refer refers to the processing method. It doesn't refer to whether or not you ever had any light there at all and you, you just let everything go to black. And somehow setting the ISO to 25.6 sometimes does pick up more in the shadows than your 6,400 or 12, eight, you know, 12,800 mm -hmm. ISO shot will get. So there are situations where I've done that. Then, oh. but do you have, with that high ISO then, are areas very underexposed because that's where all the noise is gonna show up? Right? Oh yeah, I mean that, yeah, that uh, the shadow shadows at night are, where everything is underexposed and that's why you can't just use iso that's why you need all the light you can get all the real light yeah, yeah. whether it's more time to get more photons or a wider aperture to get more light in those are the two things you really need to do as much as possible and then iso is kind of like your last resort agreed yeah but but yeah. sometimes you run out of aperture you know especially on an f2.8 mm -hmm. lens and you know you can't leave it open forever either so mm -hmm. uh especially in the older cameras that want you to only go to 30 seconds 
I'm, I'm too lazy to set a timer to, you know, go to 60 or 120. <laughs> and, you know, if you have any stars in the shot, then you have to start replacing skies. And I'm, I'm kind of a purist. I want to get everything in whatever the camera can do without a whole lot of hassle. You, Jeff, know, you, and said I don't... You, around in the, you said you were around in the days where you would just have to have a, yeah, a timer and hold the button down, right? The, the shutter, I, I the don't know if that's... Button. I don't know if that's dating me. I, I mean, I did try on a film camera. I would try some night shots, and I had the manual cable release. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've used too. those. I was, and I, was I was doing that. I was doing that in the eighties. I was actually kind of pissed when I got my f first few digital cameras. It's like, where's the hole for the manual, <laughs> you know, cable release yeah. and the the thing to hold it in? You know, yeah. you would push it in, then you would screw it, and it would lock. It's and, kind of more uh, satisfying to have that plunger thing, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was cool, you know. It was, it was like a. I remember as a kid, I had I had one, and I used. To, oh my god, my cousin and I. We. This is gonna sound really bad. We played doctor, but it was with the cable release thing. It's like I'm giving you a needle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So outtake of the day, right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now one other one other thing that I, that I, I forgot to mention uh, mistake. Having your uh, image stabilizer, lens image stabilizer on while you're on a tripod. Yeah, that's a big one. I have mixed yeah. feelings about that. Because then there are times too, like if you're in the wind, because you, what, what you're saying is you can have uh, motion introduced by the image stabilizer. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if there's wind and your whole tripod and camera are, are vibrating anyway from that, then you might want to switch it back on. And I find that at like 400 millimeters or more, uh, <coughs> excuse me, your uh, tripod can be just wiggly enough. Even if you mm -hmm. think it's stable for all your regular shots, once you yeah. get to the long lenses, unless you have a super heavy tripod and a ridiculously strong way of attaching it, uh, any amount of wind can suddenly make it, you know, feel like you're hand holding again. Mm. Mm-hmm. So often I'll, I'll have it on and, and often I'm bracketing shots and it will take three shots that are not aligned and it, you'll just have to align them later. <clears throat> so you're yeah, saying that you, as, a as, as a photographer, you have to make all those decisions out in the field. Is that what you're saying? You got to make it on the fly. You got to see <laughs> yeah. if you can get away with it, you know, having it off because you're on a tripod. And then if you've got enough zoom, then you got to consider turning it back on again. Yeah. It's like you got to know Christy, all the I rules. To, I, I stepped on you there, mm -hmm. Christy. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. No, I was just saying I've experienced that in the wind, and I agree with you there, Jeff. Sometimes it, I put it on just in ho in hopes that it'll you know make my image a little crisper. So, I think right. especially for astrophotographers, we're we're trying to get closer to everything we're shooting. You know, if you're on a a tripod, then a tracking mount, and then you're trying to get the uh, Orion Nebula, and it's moving, and you're trying to do a thirty second track shot. You've got so many things in there, even just the motor of the tracker. When you do a time lapse, sometimes the trackers can be vibrating a little bit. And so you're just trying to get enough good shots to, uh, to stack them. And in fact, a lot of the sky stacking software for, photo for astrophotography will look at, say, your stack of 100 shots, and it'll throw out all the ones that don't appear to be still, because for whatever reason, a puff of wind, or, you know, you step too close to the tripod or you're on a deck and it moved or a thermal expansion, you know, all these different reasons you could have had a shot that, you know, a whole bunch of shots that just weren't sharp like they should be. Wow. So. Now, here yeah, I we, am. <laughs> I I went out. So I had a, a photo shoot at, Mor at Moraine Lake Lodge and Moraine Lake is like one of those iconic beautiful lakes that everyone tries to go to you can't even go there by car anymore you have to take you have to reserve like a shuttle bus to get there Yikes. and uh like the lodge there to stay there is like i don't know 1100 to 1300 dollars a night and 400 in the off season 400 in the off season yeah it's just incredibly high and so uh i had the pleasure of they asked me to go sh shoot some of their cabins for them and so they let me stay up there. And so one night I'm thinking, great, I'm going to go out and uh, shoot the Milky Way because there's no other light there. It's going to be perfect. 
And I got it. I got my camera, got my tripod, got my, you know, got my granola bars and started walking into the trails at night. And I thought to myself, oh, this is perfect. It's a full moon. It's so bright out. I can see everything. I And this is going to be just absolutely fantastic. Until I got up there and I realized that the moon was so bright that you couldn't actually see the stars for the fact that the the moon was lighting up everything. I took my shot and it looks like it was shot in the day. And for some reason, it looks like there's like little specks of snow in the sky. <laughs> and I never realized that, oh, the moon can be too bright when you're doing that kind of stuff. All right. Should we move on? I've got... I, uh... I think we so, should. Okay, I thought somebody was uh, saying. This. So I've been wanting to do this kind of thing. Uh, before we get to our eclipse talk, some get some expertise from our guests here. It's open season. What do you want to bring up, Christy? I'm really enjoying actually the generative expand feature in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, I've taken a couple er photos in my earlier in my photography career where I was focusing mostly on the sky and didn't get enough of the, the ground below. And, you know, I've been adding to that. And it's quite easy, obviously, for it to do it at, on a night shot because it's mostly dark. But um, that's been a fun, fun tool to play with for sure. Nice. Mm -hmm. I think I was, I think I was kind of putting you on the spot. I thought you were going to bring up the the phone. <laughs> That's why I just why I threw it. Oh, to that, like that that Pixel Eight I've been eyeing. You mean? Yeah. yeah. Tell us. You know, we talk about iPhones because Rob and I use iPhones, and I'm not. I, I just use that one. I don't dislike the others, so it's good to have someone that's using something else. Yeah, I was just in uh, Niagara on the weekend visiting a friend and he just ordered it and he was anxiously awaiting its arrival while I was there. Unfortunately, it didn't show up till today, but I think it's 50 megapixels and it's the the phone is the camera on the phone is just mental. He sent me some macro shots today and that's, you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of taking a lot of photos with my cell phone. You know, I I do love the DSLR but and my mirrorless, but <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be stuck with a phone only, it's, you know, they say the best, the best camera is the one you have in the moment. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. that's my phone, I want it to be a camera like that. So I'm definitely considering that phone. I'm very happy to have an iPhone with me. Some, I don't remember who it was. Somebody came up with, say, they're, they're a, they are an Apple mirrorless shooter because it's a, <laughs> it does so much. You know? I, I wish I could give credit. I can't remember who it was, but the, it has a macro on the iPhone too. And the, I don't remember which, I think it was one of the Samsungs when I was at Costco, I was trying it out and it had an enormous optical zoom that was just really something. So that those things kind of make me want those. I don't know. <laughs> uh, All the toys, right? <laughs> Jeff, do you have anything you want to just bring up out of nowhere or uh, Rob and I have yeah. something real quick? Yeah, actually, I think lately what I've been really enjoying is the new Select Sky feature, the different masking tools that have yeah. been added to Lightroom. Mm -hmm. uh, you can separate things a lot better now, and it's almost like using Photoshop layers. But uh, but the sky in particular, the interesting thing is I've tried it on my night photos, and even on a dark, sc starry sky, it does a really good job of selecting really? the sky. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. So what you can do is you could do uh, more noise reduction there. or Oh, also that new denoise, AI denoise, is amazing. Um it, it has trying, mixed yeah. results at night skies. The default of 50 might be a little strong. Every once in a while, it'll take stars and make random like star trails on them. Uh, but you can, uh, one of the things that's good for selecting the sky is a lot of times at night in really dark places, you get a lot of that green air glow or even when there's aurora. And what happens is a lot of times in your foreground, your shadows, everything turns green. And it doesn't look natural. And if you try to correct the green out of the whole picture, then you start getting into purple and it will take the green air glow and either neutralize it to nothing or make it go purple. And there's almost there are very few contexts where purple is an appropriate color for a night sky. So what you can do when you select the sky, you can also select the opposite. You can uh, edit the sky or edit the whole photo the way you want, then select sky and then inverse to get everything else. And if it's been turned to green because you literally have a green light in the sky shining on your landscape, 
you can drag your uh, tint slider back towards purple for the ground just mm -hmm. to subtract out some of that green light so you can get more natural colors. I'm shooting up in Bodhi a lot. So, you know, I, yeah, there's sagebrush there, but it's not like a forest green. And if you get too much air glow, it kind of turns forest green and uh, and a lot of other things. The buildings are will start to turn greenish too. So the select sky inverse and the tint slider uh, can really help you correct colors at night or at least get them to where, I mean, it, it's actually literally there, the green light. And if you could be there in daylight with that much extra green, you'd see, you know, your landscape would be illuminated green, but it's not what people expect. So if you want to edit it to what, you know, seems more intuitive or more natural, then you can take some of that green out and that helps quite a bit. And I think it's what's really cool with what uh, has changed in the last year, I would say, with Lightroom is that um, remember when they first came out with that uh, AI generated select a sky? If you did that and you went to your next image and clicked on previous for copying over the, the settings from your previous image to the new one, it couldn't it would actually take the mask of the previous image and put it on exactly the same without recalculating where the sky was but now now what they've done is they've got it so that it recalculates on every image so if you sync if you do it to one image and then you sync it to 50 others it will look at each individual image and find the sky in each individual image and do the same kind of holy uh, crap chant. really right well yep, yep. And not only that, the the healing tool. Uh, so, for example, I've got uh, I've got a dark spot on my uh, Canon 5DSR, and I just sent it into Canon to get a new sensor. Uh, but that I can't brush it out. I can't get it out, and it's always there. So I always have to use a healing brush. But depending on what's behind the healing brush, it has to pull from a different place to heal it. Now, all I have to do is take a picture of a blank wall, put the healing on, and then sync it with all of my other images, and it gets Ooh. rid of the um, that spot out of all my images, and because it's calculating it on each one, it doesn't pull it from the wrong place. It's incredible. Wow. Is it just me, or is our listeners going to need to rewind that part? And get it again. I think I'm going to have to rewind that part. <laughs> right. All right. Well, we we can't rewind it here, but uh, but I'm gonna we, I'm looking more into that. Let's let's um, yeah. Let's play with that and talk about that a little bit later. Okay. So let's talk about the sun and how we can block it with the well, I Mr. You, I thought, Burns I thought you had, thing. I thought you I thought you had something you wanted to bring up. What did I want to bring up? Something about Christmas. Oh yes. Yes, 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 yes. And yes. I mocked you, and then I said, "Sure, whatever." I know. We can I know, do whatever I know, we want, I know. Rob. Okay, so <laughs> it's it is mid October, and for anybody out there who uh, doesn't, well, who needs a kick in the pants to get things going, start thinking about this now. What do you get a photographer for Christmas? Because let's face it, it sneaks up on you really quick. And this year, I've got a great idea for what I'm going to be sending. Well. Ron well, Pepper. maybe I'll send something to Ron, but uh, <laughs> to a photographer friend of mine. And I thought, hmm, what should you send? Because let's face it, I'm not going to buy gear for anybody because A, what I can afford is really crappy or what, uh, what, uh, what they really want is really expensive. So what do you buy somebody who is a photographer? Anybody? Um, I have already started my shopping because I uh -huh. have many, many people on my list but um there's some cute t-shirts out there like histogram t-shirts and um mm. you know some quirk you know pho photography themed shirts but i always ask for uh like a bay photo gift certificate because i oh. i don't print my work mm. enough and you know then that gives me a reason to do something up on aluminum or acrylic or something so if That's I can cool. steer them towards that. And then you would uh, use that gift, that gift certificate to buy gifts for people, right? Well, for myself. I'd, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. I'd probably use it as a, for a print of some sort. So. Yeah. Actually, you know, speaking of t-shirts, I remember there, um, the camera store had a great t-shirt and it said, safety third. 
And essentially, the first two were uh, compose, shoot, safety third. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Jeff, any recommendations? Yeah, I've got a great one. I just found this, figured this out today. So uh, when I'm out shooting with people, what comes up the most often that people want to borrow is, hey, Jeff, you got an Allen wrench for my tripod. <laughs> or for their plate, or to get yes. their plate on and off of a camera. That may require an Allen wrench, too. And there, you know, there are a lot of different uses for them. So mm -hmm. I often you know, fish around for my Allen wrench set, and it's not in my pocket. And maybe it's not in the bag I have with me. Maybe it's in the bag back in the car. So I found out that I ended up having three or four Allen wrench sets, and I put one everywhere. And then inevitably... The one that I have with me is English when they need a metric or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there's this thing I found today and I said, this is perfect because I won't leave it in the car or in another bag. There are these things called uh, snowflake multi-tool oh, and I the snowflake, the snowflake can be throwing stars. Yeah, but it can, <laughs> it, but it can be your keychain thing, but on the ends of it are different size Allen wrenches. And nice. inside, inside, in between the snowflakes, you can uh, turn nuts with it, you know, to, to get, you know, they're all different. It's a multi-tool. It, it looks also like it'd can... be a good weapon in a pinch, too. <laughs> exactly. I... Yeah. Ninja throwing star. I would love but, for you to go through like airport security with one of those and say, no, 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 no. This is for my camera. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have That's one right. more, too. These Enerloop Pro batteries for my flash. Yeah. I always ask for those from my family because they're something I can get off Amazon. But, you know, I'll say, give me eight double A's or something because I can always use more of those. And I have so many now that I'm using them in all my, mm -hmm. you know, my th thermostat and everything else around the house. But they last forever and they hold the charge forever. So nice. And they're, they're regular size batteries, though? Rechargeable? Yep. yep. Okay. Double A's, mm -hmm. they're great. And that's uh, uh that's interloop. Is that like a particular Enter, interloop? Good... E N E R L L O P. Yeah, interloops are amazing. Yeah. They are they hold the charge like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, yeah you can have I... a set in your flash shoot a whole wedding all day on the same batteries. Like mm -hmm. it, they die right about the time that you're ready to go. So. <laughs> yeah, you want to find the ones that say what was it twenty four fifty? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah, the Interloop Pro ones, I think. There's there's yeah, Interloop yep. and Interloop Pro, so. Mm -hmm. The black ones. I, yeah. yeah. I use those for uh, flashlights, too, because they don't run out as fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently there's some applications, like with timers, where they tell you not to use uh, rechargeable batteries, and I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. but That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, my hose timers for my vineyard, uh, when I want to water different rows at different times, it says do not use rechargeable batteries. And I'm not sure why. So I just learned that so Jeff is to... a vineyard. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it's funny not... because my pick for Christmas was going to be wine. Right? <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. Wine, whiskey, and what's the other W? Weed. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to guess weapons, but. <laughs> well, yeah. No, it, it is funny. The, the only other. Oh, so. Anyone out there who needs an Allen wrench, uh, next time you are at an Ikea, just go into their parts area <laughs> and grab a handful of their <laughs> Allen, Allen wrenches because those are the ones that you need the most and just scatter them everywhere throughout your house. Are they free? They're free. They're <laughs> oh, free. nice. Yeah, go to Ikea. Nice. I very, very rarely ever need more than there's one specific size that does... All, almost all of my Allen wrenching for gear. And it's rare to have anything else. So yeah, that's I the idea. That one. one size in all every bag <laughs> and everywhere and every, every drawer has that same little <laughs> size one. So that's a good yeah. tip, though. That's Rob's gem for the day. Go to IKEA and steal, don't steal a handful of Allen wrenches. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice, <laughs> because you have a twang that you need to tighten. <laughs> All right. Well, Robbie tried to move us on. Let's uh, let's go ahead and move on to talking about eclipses because uh, we don't want to keep people too long. Yes, um, and but, everyone's uh, on the edge of their seat already. Let's go. Well, yeah. Uh, my reason for introducing this last time was to get listeners thinking about it. Don't miss out because last time, for me anyway, it was too late to get myself together and go go do anything with the eclipse. 
and even though this year I might have uh, other reasons I can't really get away, but at least it won't be because I didn't know about it. So um, we talked a little bit about it last time, just to introduce things and talk about that it's coming up on April. Um, April what? April um, uh, 6th? Or April 8th? 8th? Yeah. You know, I've heard 6th as well, but uh, <laughs> look at the calendars. There are links in the show notes to um, at least one site that I mentioned earlier, earlier show yeah. that is. Um, okay, so that's coming up on April 8th, um, but when talking about this, uh, and Christy brought, said when I, when I, okay, I'm gonna skip all that. There's something called, an, <laughs> uh, there's something called a total eclipse where it's blocked out and it's supposed to be epic. You guys can tell us your experience in a second, but there's also this annular eclipse. Is that right? So a annular? So like, like annually? No, it, or, no. Well, no. I'll, I'll take, no. I'll take this. It comes from the... Latin, like uh, in, I know in Spanish ring is anillo and I guess annular annulus or something means ring. So it's a, when a, you see a, the ring. The, an, an, okay. Learning yeah. ring Another fire. word that's. Uh, <laughs> Be careful there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a. That's Rob's job on this Non-explicit <laughs> podcast, so I can't say what I was going to say. So, it but yes. It's all of anus, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Are we going to, are we going to get banned for that? No. So we're going to get, I, I hope not. <laughs> so what is it like the the moon is would that be farther away it looks farther away it's a partial eclipse and mm. yeah um it gives the impression of a smaller moon during during that yeah. eclipse so you get so, like a like a ring of that's what you called it when the I, ring of fire yeah yeah Huh. It, it looks cool now that i've been now that i'm aware of it i've been looking at it but um have you guys uh, shot that before jeff or christy not the annular, no. I was hoping to annular. this year, but I didn't get a chance to plan a trip. How far away? Uh, it's kind of, um, if you look on the maps, that it's going through... Uh, I think Oregon. No northwest, yeah, northwest U.S., down through Texas again. And <laughs> apparently, um, you can see, I watched uh, some videos about this today. Um, you can see the eclipse at sunset if you're off the coast of Brazil. <laughs> Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> so, uh, that, yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Maybe it sounds like one of the cooler things. I don't know if in real life it would work out that way, but huh. I don't know. I don't know. Can anybody get away and try to get to the the zone where you can really see it? Hmm. Yeah, we're actually really close to the uh, path of totality. We could be, uh, well, okay. really close is a relative thing. We could go to northern Nevada in about yeah. four hours and be there. We could go to eastern Nevada in about five or six hours and have a good spot. Uh, but there's a storm coming down from, you know, Canada, British Columbia, Oregon, Washington, that's going to follow the eclipse and cut right through northern Nevada. And it looks like we'll probably have clouds. The forecast for those places that we could drive to in totality uh, it says either partly cloudy or partly sunny, neither of oh, which man. is promising yeah. enough to make for me to make a six hour drive. So I was gonna see it locally and Reno, even though it's three hours from the center line, uh, it was still gonna be 85%. And with this annular eclipse, the best you could do is 90% because there's gonna be a 5% you know, ring around it uh, or that adds up to 5% on, well, hmm. 10%. Yeah. So it was actually pretty close to a, a good full annular eclipse. But it looks like we. I might think have you're clouds. close too, Rob. Um, for par okay, a good partial, anyway. Really? You'd have to get. You'd have to go down through like Southern Washington, I think, before you got into it, wasn't it? Actually, Ron, you'll have about eighty percent, I think. California is seventy to ninety percent, and you're about the eighty, eighty percent line, I think. You know, I, uh, last hmm. in the in 2017, we I, I think I had about eighty five percent from San Francisco, and it was, it looked like a. It looked like a crescent moon you know it didn't uh yeah. by itself it didn't have anything spectacular looking just unless you knew what it was so i don't know if that's the same if it'll be roughly the same again i'm not sure have you guys noticed and maybe this is just me maybe it was because of that third w but i realized that <laughs> when i was looking at like the um, uh, shadows cast by trees during the eclipse all of a sudden things look like that moon shape anyone else no would i can see have that any shadows would you Testing. no 
Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know why, but everything looked like it was uh, it mo like crescent C shaped uh, when it was um, shining down. Maybe it was just. Maybe it was the third W, or maybe the first two Ws. Which uh, whiskey or wine or weed? weed. I, it says I that like, I like my Ws. caused by the atmospheric Earth's atmospheric winds. Ooh, what? Tell us more. <laughs> the sun has been reduced to such a small light source that, like, it can cast uh, shadows of the atmosphere, basically, like oh, the detail wow. of it. So neat. Yeah, because I, I know my my kids and I were out uh, trying to see because a everything was orange, which was really cool. Sepia, yeah. Yeah, right? and it wasn't because of all the forest fires that are around us. It was actually because of um the sun so that was that was quite neat and then but one of my kids said look it looks like uh it looks like a moon on the ground and we were looking at the shadows the entire time hmm. so that was a that was a neat one well, anyways well, was that the 2017 i think it was yeah hmm. yeah um okay so what updates do we have with the uh, uh the, the eclipse if you're planning for it uh, uh, you know, I was really surprised at this. Best Western, Best Western Hotels sent me an email saying, "Hey, for all you Eclipse chasers, book your hotels now." <laughs> I thought, "Oh yeah, uh, they, they're going to be booked." People that live in the, the the line, they're all saying, "Don't come here, don't come here." <laughs> when I went, was looking in Rex, I ended up going to Rexburg, Idaho, for totality during 2017, and. Um, the super eight was charging like a grand a night um so Holy. my girlfriend and i drove up in like a big suv and our worst case scenario was going to crash in the back but that's not super appealing we wanted showers and all that <laughs> so i actually went on a facebook group called girls love travel that has like a million members and posted about our dilemma and a girl offered to let us stay in their trailer on her land for free so nice oh wow that worked out awesome but yeah i'm yeah. definitely already on the hotel thing um for next year jeez i think okay. you have to either know somebody or be somebody to get you know, get a place to stay in yeah those places oh, okay so uh for uh, for our listeners then you two have experience on this number one okay get a hotel now if you're <laughs> getting out there or get a camp airbnb or whatever yeah yeah just book it now Aside from that, okay, let's talk gear. What is the minimum amount of gear that you would need? Shutter release, tripod, an ND, or if so, I, I built my own solar filter. I got special paper from a uh, like a telescope store, and mm -hmm. is that built... what's called astro solar film? I think that's yes. exactly right. Yeah. Okay, I, I'd have that written down, so I didn't. I, you're, you're, we can't hear you in, right now, Jeff. Jeff's I trying to talk. I think the uh, manufacturer is Bader, B-A-A-D-E-R. That's right, yeah. I think we lost your regular mic, Jeff. Yeah, that, there was a, I'm going to make it my YouTube pick anyway. Uh, there's a good a guy that talks about making those DIY. Oh, what, okay, does that so, do? what does it do exactly? Yeah. What is the paper for? Like, why, what, what is the difference between the solar film and uh, and uh, just your ND? What, I... Uh, Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> so, is is a paper there to act as like an additional ND filter? The the solar filter, if that's what you're talking about, that is the ND filter. And we should stop saying ND filter because you cannot stack ND filters and get the same effect. Because okay. what will burn your eye is not necessarily what's being knocked down by the ND filter. So gotcha. you can't trust normal filters to filter out the stuff that's going to burn your retina. Mm -hmm. So you have to use the special solar filter okay. and it will cut the light down. I don't know what the exact amount is, whether it's, you know, 24 times or 50 times, but it cuts the light down tremendously. Is it, so, just, the, is it just the extreme amount of cutting light down or is it cutting down certain wavelengths or colors? I think like, it's doing both. I think okay. it's doing both. It's letting through some uh, some visible wavelengths while also cutting the volume, the magnitude of those wavelengths way, way down. 
Gotcha. And you can either go and just buy a, a nice filter or like I said, they'll, I'll, I'll have a link for this anyway, but you can just get the paper and then you're just in the, you're just in the business of making a cutout to fit your lens is what you're mm -hmm. essentially doing. Okay. So here's the thing. And w we were talking about this earlier and uh, Christy had pointed out, um, I think that, uh, you know, you, you want to, um, she had said that you want to get focus, but if you have the, you, you can buy like a glass filter that does all this, but if you're having to screw a filter on your camera, you're wiggling your lens and you might get in the way of the, of the view and you might be trying to track the track it on a tracking mount, say, and maybe do a time lapse. You know, you see those nice national geographic, the sun comes, uh, you know, behind the moon or the moon comes in front of the sun and, and then it, you know, goes into totality and then it comes out and, you're trying to do that you don't really want to be touching your camera so mm -hmm. the the key is for me when you have that really nice light film material it's kind of like a mylar uh would be to put that on something that you can place over the end of your camera and not wiggle it or jiggle it or have to screw anything in or tape just anything gently, on. just gently lay it over yeah so you want to mm -hmm. get like a piece of tubing that's a little bit bigger in diameter, like a cardboard tube that's bigger in diameter than your camera. And you only need an inch or two to have it hang on the end of your, of your lens and tape the filter over the end of that. And that way you can just very gently set that uh, little uh, contraption you made, light, uh, simple contraption without uh, moving your camera any appreciable amount. Um, and if you're doing a time lapse, you can do it in between frames, you know, kind of a, a, mm -hmm. a quick put it there and drop it kind of deal. And I've even bought a, there's another solar filter in this one. I don't know, but the Bader is almost like converting it to black and white. Your sun comes out white. So you see, and you see this all the time with solar shots, uh, oh, you know, the white sun going behind the black moon. Um, there's another one that when you take solar pictures, it, it comes out very orange. It looks like more of a sunset sun. And as a landscape photographer, that kind of appealed to me. So, <clears throat> so I have to I have to find this these two different types of filter material, make two uh, rigs to go on the end of my lens, mm -hmm. and then I have to research how much each one cuts out light because the exposure is going to be different with the different two. So, okay. you know, one of them, you know, one of them might cut 10 stops. The other one might cut 15 stops or whatever. I'll have to, I'll have to figure out what's going on there. So, so when we're talking about exposure, just for our, uh, for our listeners there, uh, what settings would you be looking at? Are you looking at like ISO 100 and F22 or are we going uh, the regular f8 to f8 probably pretty, or probably pretty yeah. wide because you're focusing in one far away plane right yeah i'd think like iso 100 or 200 and then f8 to start with anyway and then when it so, when, before totality you're going to shoot fast and then you're going to slow it down after totality okay so i can see my shot from the 2017 uh august eclipse uh, I had F8 and a 60th of a second at ISO 200. And that's what I was using the Bader uh, Astro Solar Film. Okay. Now, let me ask you then. If we're trying to cut out the amount of light that's coming in, why wouldn't you use F22? Uh, because the filter cuts so much that you would then have too dark of a photo. Oh, you, okay. the Astro Solar Filter, all right. And because remember, the camera only your, goes to 30 seconds bulb, right? <laughs> well, not only just that, but also you might be looking through your viewfinder. The film, there are two kinds of beta film, too. One is a little darker, and the light, I use the lighter one so I get more light for my camera. If you use the darker one, you can actually uh, look through your device at the eclipse because it darkens it enough. But the other one doesn't. So your camera can handle it, but your eye can't. So you kind of have to know which one you're using and be Speaking very of careful exposure, with that. Uh, how, how fast of a shutter speed do you need to use? Because I, I always go back to the moon that's actually moving fast, faster than you would think. So uh, you have to have a moving object. 4,000? Kind of well, here's oh, the much? thing. If you're... 
if you're shooting at night, you usually use a 500 rule or a 400 rule. So let's say you have a 400 millimeter lens. That means you have to have an exposure of under one second or the, or the sun will move too much. So you actually have okay. tons of leeway to, in the exposure. Now, those rules are really made for wide cameras in like landscape astrophotography type settings. So I wouldn't over rely on it with a super telephoto lens. So, you know, you want a huge margin of error. So maybe you want to be better than a quarter. Ron, you'll appreciate this since you. Jeff's freezing up a little bit here. Up there in Bodhi, mm -hmm. which is a uh -oh. fan, which is a classic ghost town. And he's being okay, haunted so by the pipes. I'll there he's back. <clears throat> Sorry, you, you said okay. I would appreciate it. So what I was going to say is, yeah, I actually used a for the last total eclipse where I wanted a lot of detail on the corona. So you have to make sure your entire <laughs> sequence is within the time that you have before the sun will move too much and start to uh, to drag a little bit yeah. and get blurry. What, what, what Jeff said when he was uh, off for a second was uh, used bracketing and HDR or exposure fusion, I think. Definitely bracketing. Yeah. Yeah. We actually did, uh, that around that time we, we had, uh, some, a couple experts put together a little tutorial and I think to this day it's up on HDR <laughs> website and, um, and uh, Jeff, we probably talked about it back then, but that's one way of, if you want to have any detail at all of the moon, which, you know, it's facing you and it has a rather bright thing behind it. If you want to have any uh, detail whatsoever of the moon, you really have to get multiple exposures. Yeah. Okay. Another question that I think that uh, some of our listeners might be wondering is, do you need a, uh, the type of camera, DSLR, mirrorless? Is there going to be an issue with going mirrorless on something like this? See, my the lens that I'm using doesn't adapt to my mirrorless so it's a non-issue for me but that's a really good question i mean my uh, yeah, my dslr has a live view mode so i can use it like a mirrorless mm -hmm. will that will that be a benefit though mm -hmm. with uh that way you can look at you can just look at the screen where the sun is there without burning your eyes i think that might be if you're the, is, and good for focusing too because you won't be able yeah. to see like fully through yeah any tricks for focusing when like we were saying how like if you need to go fairly wide open just for the amount of time you don't want to go too long of exposure any any tricks on focusing focus when... use the live view to focus on the moon and also before the eclipse go out and just practice with the filter on and and get mm. used to that you know whole experience that's something i didn't do and i wasn't a professional photographer then either and it was kind of a shit show when I was, you know, fumbling and all that. And I wish I'd been a yeah. little more fluid with the gear that I was using. So I, I think going out and making a couple trial runs with practicing with the moon or something is probably a good idea. Hmm. That was going to be one of my main takeaways is to practice it. Dr do the drill, do the practice, yeah. just like you would in a sport or whatever. And, and pretend that you're, you know, go out and shoot the, the moon regularly. Yeah. I remember so, wondering why I couldn't see it after totality. And, and of course the filter was still on too. So yeah, just mm. that un unfamiliarity of not knowing, you know, all the, all the, all the paces of what was going to go down. And now had, I'm, now I'm our, ready. We had our, uh, we had Levi on here talking about how he ended up not enjoying the moment whatsoever because he was busy helping other people shoot. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, don't, if you're focusing on your camera, you're going to miss this rather epic moment. So mm -hmm. practice, right. yeah. yeah. I find that also if you, if you do have your uh, solar filter easy to put on and off, you can take it off, click your camera out of the, the holder, the plate, uh, focus on something a mile or two away, take a picture, zoom in, make sure it's sharp. And once you have it, make sure you have your autofocus off. And I actually taped down the focus ring with masking mm -hmm. tape, with gaffer's tape. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, one of the reasons is when I was shooting that eclipse, I had the camera pointed up at such a high angle that anything you do to touch the camera or even just maybe the lens heating up and cooling off, eventually the focus started to drift. 
just the weight mm -hmm. of the elements of the lens and whatever else was going on, uh, it started to go out of focus. So I wish I had taped the, the ring down. Uh, well, Jeff, then, either of you, I guess, can you use a hyperfocal distance kind of a setup in this situation or is that, are you using too long of lenses? Like, like for just to, cause other people are listening to this, you know, I do stuff like interiors and uh, I always did three sixties and stuff. And you, if you have a wide angle lens, you can get everything in focus really easy. But if, if you set the hyperfocal distance for your lens, it means that everything from a certain point out to infinity is in focus. Mm -hmm. But can you do that in this situation of using, say, like a 300 millimeter lens? We didn't even talk about that, but I'm guessing something like that. Uh, are you able to just set the hyperfocal right when you get there or even before, maybe before you leave the house? I don't know. Tape it down, like you said, and then not worry about it. Is that possible? Well, here's the thing. Yeah, I mean, hyperfocal, of course, for landscape, you have tons of depth of field. Even at night at f2.8, you have a pretty darn good depth of field. Uh, if you're shooting at 14 millimeters or 16 millimeters, but the more yeah. you zoom in, so if you're shooting with 400 millimeters to get the sun, you'd, you'd have to look up the hyperfocal distance, know what your exposure, uh, your f-stop is going to be. And I shot that last time at f8. Mm -hmm. And then you'd look up the right chart for four, 400 millimeters at f8. You're not going to have a lot of depth of field. You could get the sun behind... Uh, a mountain certainly miles away or behind you know build, building on a hill maybe a mile away but where that hyperfocal distance is you know you might have to still focus a thousand yards away uh, i don't you know i'm just i'm guessing here because i've never done it but it, you it, really want everything to effectively be at infinity or pretty darn close to it it's it's pretty neat because like i i know when i was out uh <clears throat> shooting the other night the only I couldn't see what I was shooting. I was shooting with mirrorless, so I, you know, viewfinder was useless uh, because it's so dark. Um, but when I was looking at focusing, I was thinking about it, and I thought, well, I know that the mountain across the lake is probably a kilometer or so away. Therefore, my you know, three three inches, five inches, you know, one meter, two meter, three meter, five. And then there's infinity and i just figured that somewhere between the you know 10 meters and infinity is where i need to be does it make much difference how between there like will it make much difference yeah it really does really? when you're shooting at a long focal length uh i i i am a huge fan with at night with wide lenses Mm -hmm. uh, and I like having the manual lenses because I can see if the line is near infinity or if I've bumped it. And yeah. I know I, I used to know in all my lenses exactly where to put that line to be at roughly a hyperfocal distance. Uh, but lately, I've gotten less confident in that. And especially the more you want to zoom in, I've started doing some, you know, I've done some interesting night shots this year at 70 millimeters and so forth. And at a really wide uh aperture uh the sensitivity before you lose either infinity or your close subject starts to get really huh yeah that's it's a it's not you know you and i rob are used to these wide angle lenses Sorry. where it's really easy but i think yeah once you start zooming i just i just feel like if you set the zoom excuse me set the focus at the distance of the moon mm -hmm. and expect everything else further to infinity to be in focus that's a reasonable ask, I think, even if it's a long lens. But again, I haven't tested it out. So, yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. My, my experience with the longer lenses is that I don't trust the focus scales at all, really, mm -hmm. and I feel like I can't because that you'll get back from a shoot, you'll think you'll you'll take the picture, you look on the right. viewfinder, <laughs> it looks great, you think you've got it, and you get back, and, and it's just not there. It's just unsharp. So you either have to uh, use autofocus on something, you know, what you think is going to be at the hyperfocal distance, and then inspect the shot. Or you have to do the manual focus where autofocus is off, you have live view on, you do your 10x magnification, and you manually get it exactly where you want it to be. And uh, then, and then you then take a picture. And mark it with a pen. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you tape it down. You know, yeah. you just... 
Oh, and then that's the other thing. If you've got a mirrorless camera, taping it down doesn't do any good because you're fly by <laughs> wire. So yeah. there are actually settings on most mirrorless cameras. One of them, like, and it varies by brand. One of the cameras says, when I turn off my camera, return it to where the focus was. So that's mm. cool. So you want to make sure that's on. I don't think it's on by default. And then on the, the Canon, I'm trying to remember, it's... Oh, I forget what it's called. Lori knows the name of the of the the menu item you got to find. But every camera is different, and you got to find that feature so that you can tape it down and leave it on, and and make sure your camera won't power down at a certain amount of time, or you have to have that feature that either returns it exactly to where the focus was, or at least doesn't mess it up. So, okay. yeah. So, so mirrorless cameras, you have a little extra homework. All right, so we've got on our checklist right now. We got the hotels, we got tripod, we got the camera, we got the lens, we got the solar filters. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then go out there and practice shooting the sun, shooting things that are far away. Mark your, uh, take a, uh, you know, I I used to do this with uh, with my real estate stuff as well, where I take a the fine tip sharpie and just like Christy was saying, mark your lens. And you mark it and say, okay, this is this is for far away at f9. This is the far away for f7, 7.1. This is what it is for 5.6. But you can mark it and make it work. All right. So we got those tips. Any last tips? Practice, practice, practice. Aside well, the that, other one is remote there's shutter. one more. <laughs> remote shutter. There's one okay. more. Mm -hmm. All the planning in the world uh, comes down to that last hour and whether or not you have clouds in that location. Mm -hmm. So even when you've picked what you think is the best location, have a plan B that's at least 200 miles away and know uh, ahead of time when you have to make the call to leave to get to the drier, clearer place, or maybe over a mountain range where you have a second shot if you're gonna, if all your plans get messed up by the weather at the last minute. Yeah, so Jeff, goes, that's a good tip. I'm going to have to come up with a plan B. That's a pro B. tip. Yeah. That's a pro tip. Okay. Christy, so any other tips? So what you're is book two places. It's, it's tough to book one, so book two. No, no, no. Yeah. You, you booked one that's in the line. The second one you can drive to. You just have to know how long the drive is and when you have to make the call to leave to get to the other place. Because when I was in Jackson Hole, the, you know, they said, oh, the weather's great 80% of the time or whatever it was. But if I had gone to Wyoming about three hours east, it's 95% of the time. And it turned out on that day that that might have been a, a better bet. But we got, you know, we decided to take the chance at the four hour point. We said, let's just let's just wait it out. And uh, and it worked. But you definitely want to have that plan B. All right. Okay. We can. We're gonna. We're proving our thesis. We can that we can talk all day. So before we do our YouTube picks, I just want to get. I'm getting live reports in from Max, from uh, Angela, Andrew, who's all who's basically uh, saying what we said. Lots of they're announcing all kinds of Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw um, AI items, and uh, Colin Smith has uh, something I hadn't heard of yet reflection removal Ooh, they were demonstrating Ooh. nice reflection removal so i don't know lots <clears throat> of interesting things coming out of that it sounds like so okay should we do youtube pics real quick <laughs> we're going really long yes okay so uh i'm gonna start this off because this actually ties into the uh topic that we had about common mistakes okay common mistake that uh, has uh, that we usually photographers want to do is to upgrade the software right away when there's new features that come out. So a new uh, new Mac OS Sonoma just came out. Everyone wanted to jump onto that. Uh, new Photoshop. Everyone wants to jump onto that. If you are a professional photographer and you require your Photoshop to work the way it does to keep money rolling in, wait a bit. Because I'll tell you right now, if you use actions, if you use droplets, if you like to use Lightroom and open up raw files in Photoshop, Sonoma and the current Lightroom will destroy that. 
And so if anyone has that problem where you can't open your raw files now from Lightroom because you just upgraded to Sonoma or you just upgraded to Lightroom, uh, I've got a YouTube pick. Me. I've got a <laughs> video on my channel and it's youtube.com uh, slash real dash estate dash photography that will show you how you can fix a your droplets being broken and your raw files not opening up from Lightroom. But now with Sonoma, uh, the droplets, there's a new problem. The droplets still won't work. So uh, oh. caution, a cautionary tale, don't upgrade, wait a bit and upgrade later. Agreed. I'll go really quickly because I've already been talking about mine. On the previous show, I picked Nebula Photos and I referenced them today and also Totality Town. And I'll put links to them, both talking about Eclipse and giving advice in very different styles, let's put it that way. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, Jeff, you're next in the, the list here. Uh, I just found out recently that NASA JPL does a monthly update on what are the main astronomical viewing and shooting opportunities for that month. So uh, like, you know, they call it what's up. So right now it's what's up in October. Last month it was what's up in September. And they do one every month. Now it's a pretty busy channel. So sometimes it's hard to find that particular uh, one in the stream of, of information they're putting out. But when they find, when you find them, they're great. And it's pretty concise. It's pretty fast. The, uh, the visuals are good. And uh, often I'll find two or three more things to go out and shoot or to think about while I'm out shooting. Uh, you know, things like conjunctions, if a planet's going to be near the moon and that kind of stuff. Uh, this month they have the, uh, this solar eclipse and they uh, mention the, the next one that's coming. And in fact, <clears throat> that was the one where I, I saw their picture of the United States and the path that this solar eclipse is going to go down. And they showed the 10% lines and the entire country is going to be see, be able to see at least some, our country, but most of North America is going to be able to see some degree of solar eclipse. And I didn't know that it was that generally available. So, you know, every time I watch it, I learn something. So NASA JPL is worth uh, checking out. All right, nice. Christy, what's yours? Mine is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's just, he's got a podcast. He's got a YouTube. It's just every, I learned so much from that guy. My, my close friend put me onto him a few months ago and wow. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> I just saw him in some television show, didn't I? Uh -huh. Popped up somewhere. All right. Well, let's uh, let's not make too much ado then, and uh, get us out of here. Why don't we uh, got the music playing in the background just in case you can't hear it? Um, let's uh, real quick, uh, ladies first this time. Christy, where should people find you? What do you want to What do you want to tell people to know about you? On the um, on Instagram, you can find me. I'm Aurora Chaser YYC. Um, yeah, I'm also on Facebook. The, the Aurora photos are awesome. People, check it out. Thank you. Um, Jeff. Well, my biggest uh, cache of photos is on Flickr. I've got about 10,000 there, but I'm pretty active on Facebook. I have a Facebook page as well, and uh, our workshops are listed on the website, jeffsullivanphotography.com. Well, you didn't sound old-fashioned when you talked about shooting film and stuff, but using Flickr, <laughs> that's another thing. <laughs> It's uh, it's the best way to catalog your photos and find them and not unlimited to storage eat. too. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's a good uh, deal. Cool, Rob, you have a course, well, right? Yep, that's right. You can find me on MySpace at. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am at robmoroto.com, and yes, I have a real estate photography course on there. We just released a new section about add-ons and how to add more services onto your business, including virtual staging and how you can do all that. So check it out. Use the coupon code in the show notes here and get a little bit of a discount. And yeah, come and roll. Come learn from me and hear me talk more. <laughs> <laughs> Rob's course is really good if you're into that. I've learned a ton. Um, I'm Ron Pepper. I don't really have anything to promote unless you know people in the bay area send them my way and um you know what let's uh, not keep any, any any longer and just say we can let rob play us out but just say adios
Good night. Thank Good. you. <laughs> night, everybody. Right. Thanks, guys. Okay. Have fun. Don't look at the sun directly through a lens. True.